everyone, and welcome to the National D-Day Memorial's 76th commemoration of D-Day. Just one year ago today, we welcomed more than 10,000 visitors to the memorial and paid tribute to our D-Day veterans with a once-in-a-lifetime celebration. Over 100 D-Day and World War II veterans, all in their mid-90s, joined us for the event. Today, it is quiet, but no less important of an occasion as we reflect on how one generation over a half century ago did the undoable. This memorial stands as a visible reminder of those achievements and the need each of us has in the here and now to say thank you to all who put themselves in peril to preserve the liberty we enjoy. Today, I stand here in front of our sculpture, Les Monuments au Mor, which was given by Mr. Wildenstein and his family in 2002 to the memorial with the cooperation of the Council General of Normandy and the community of Trevière, France. We deeply treasure it and what it represents to both France and the United States. This sculpture is an exact recasting of the original, which stands outside of a small church in Trevière in memory of the 44 young men of that village who died in World War I. A bittersweet reminder of both France's victory in the Great War and the blood spilt to secure it, Les Monuments au Mort stood for scarcely two decades before finding itself surrounded by a new generation of invaders. Sometime during the Normandy invasion, a round struck the head of the figure and removed the face, creating an eerie and powerful reminder of the destructiveness of war and the fragility of peace. The Wildenstein family presented this sculpture to the memorial with this inscription, with our eternal gratitude to the United States of America for restoring France's freedom, for granting asylum to our parents and for halting the extermination of a people in memory of the American soldiers who gave their lives on the beaches of Normandy. The ultimate success at Normandy came at a terrible cost. Today, thousands of miles away from that battleground, this memorial stands upon a consecrated admixture of Bedford soil and Norman sand. It memorializes the valor, fidelity, and sacrifice of all the Allied forces on D-Day. Today's commemoration is a necessary step in continuing to preserve the lessons and legacy of D-Day for present and future generations. In just a moment, you will hear a few of those important stories full of determination, courage, selflessness, and sacrifice. We must never forget what was achieved all those years ago, and we must always, always share their stories. In remembering them, we honor them. Thank you for helping us honor them today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in awe of the beauty of the world you have created and humbled by your goodness unto us, we invoke your presence. Today, we pause to remember the lives and courageous deeds of the men and women who, throughout the history of this nation, have taken up arms to defend the rights you have granted us. Too often, we take these freedoms for granted. Forgive us for that lapse. During the 76th anniversary of the Allied landing in Normandy, awaken us to the courage and commitment that enabled the Allied forces to persevere in adversity, to bridle the impulse to revenge, and to show mercy in victory. Inspire us by their example to do our duty as citizens each day and, when asked to serve our country, to render worthy service in response. Inspire us to establish our values by the measure of those heroes, heroes whose feet touched higher ground on 6 June 1944, the day they died so that freedom would not. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched 
were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave The briefing officer's words are still clear in my ears today. Okay, boys, this is it, D-Day. While that briefing was taking place, paratroopers had been jumping into France. Later, our formation of 35 B-17s flew out of the slow-moving, watery clouds, making their way toward Normandy. Compressed into the bald turret of the warhorse, our B-17, I alternately surveyed its underbelly for hits in the surrounding sky for German fighters. Our target was the concrete and steel barrier running along the Normandy shoreline 17,000 feet below. Flak honed in on our formation. The warhorse bucked and yawed from the concussions. Explosions up and down the beach told me the Navy gunners had found their targets. A moment later, we had two, and the pilot gave the ship to the bombardier. The bomb bay doors opened and the 3,800 pounders dropped through. I remember looking at my watch. It was 6.15. Below, thousands of warships, transports, and landing craft crowded the channel. Rotating my turret, I glanced back toward England. As far as I could see, hundreds and hundreds of bombers blackened the sky. Coming back around, I was greeted by a burst that rolled the ship and sent a chunk of hot shrapnel into my turret, where it ricocheted off one of the machine guns before lodging itself with pile driver force into the thick sole of my fur-lined boot. Those people are trying to kill me, I thought. Suddenly, screaming in on us at 10 o'clock high, there were 10 ME-109s. The warhorse convulsed as the top turret gunner and waste gunner engaged them. A B-17 from an upper element of the formation fell away at 4 o'clock, its number two and three engines on fire. The bomber began to roll and disappeared in a ball of fire and debris as it exploded. A second bomber, its number three engine blazing, drifted below my turret. I watched one of its crew bail out of the waste door and saw his parachute fill with air as they flew away from the plane. The chute of the man jumping behind him snagged on the bomber's horizontal tail elevator and he was dragged. Spinning end over end, the man fell to the earth as the B-17 exploded. As the bombardier released our payload over the target, the German fighters again appeared. I engaged one without success and then they were gone. Later, we touched down in Great Ashfield to prepare for our third run, but the plane's shrapnel damaged landing gear collapsed. Skidding along crazily and spewing fuel and sparks, the plane finally stopped when the right wing and its propellers jammed into the ground alongside the runway. Two missions, a crash landing, and 12 hours later, D-Day had come to an end for the crew of the Warhorse. I was posted to the 551st Assault Flotilla early in 1944 and on D-Day served as leader of the first wave. It was my task to take A Company of the 116th Infantry to Veerville at half past six. I took the company commander, Captain Taylor Fellers, in my LCA. After five miles we came across some landing crafts for tank, which I had known nothing about. Taylor Fellers said they were carrying the small tanks that were to land before his troops. This was complete news to me and we were making greater speed than the LCTs. They were really bouncing around with their load. He and I had a decision to make, whether to get there on time without the tanks or to go in late after they had landed. It had been impressed on all of us how critical to the operation the timetable was. We had to be there at half past six. Captain Fellers and I agreed there was no point in waiting and we left them behind. 
Looking toward the shore, I gave a signal with two flags, and we headed in full speed until we crunched on the beach. Captain Fellers had directed me to the precise spot he wanted us to land, but with the tide out, we beached some 30 yards from the shoreline. The ramp dropped and the door opened behind it. Troops in the center file moved through the opening as rapidly as they could, but in full kit, they went one at a time. Captain Fellers started forming the company into a skirmish line. Then the Germans began to fire, some sort of heavy anti-tank rounds, it seems. They had no trouble penetrating the LCAs, which could handily withstand rifle and machine gun fire. Mortars started falling in, and the craters that were supposed to have been on the beach to provide cover for those troops were not there as expected. The beach was flat, the tide was out, and the defenders, now firing in earnest, could not be seen. I wanted to return fire, but could not find a target, and my LCA was bouncing around so badly in the surf I feared hitting our own troops. Anxious to protect my own command, we put out to sea. The sailor always has a great respect for the troops he carries. His job is to get the troops where they are supposed to be, when they are supposed to be there. When his job is finished, the troops' job starts. If he doesn't always have the chance to say it, from his heart, he still wishes the soldier the best of luck. I wished Taylor Fellers and his company luck, but I never saw any of them again. All of my lot were killed. I was first sergeant of Company D of the 2nd Ranger Battalion when we landed at Point du Hoc on D-Day. We fired our grappling hooks, then the boat ramp dropped. Shot through my right side as I led the men ashore, I disappeared in water over my head. I came out of the water with my arms full of gear and made for the ropes. The one I went up may have been D Company's, but it could have easily belonged to E or F. After a little confrontation near the base of the cliff, my men, the second platoon of D Company, started up. There had been 22 of us in my boat, and we were all up and rushing as quickly as we could to the gun emplacements that were our objective. We got to our objective in a matter of minutes, only the guns weren't there. As we searched, we would encounter gun positions or enemy patrols, engage and close with them quickly, and then continue the search. By the time we got to the coastal road, I had a dozen men left, and we still hadn't found the guns, and we were surrounded by troops. Eventually, we just stumbled on them, just pure luck. It was nothing brave or calculating. We were just a couple of rangers doing our job, that's all. That done, our orders were to hold our blocking position on the coastal road until relieved. And we did, despite three counterattacks in which we were outnumbered tenfold. Like everyone else that day, we did what we had to do. I like to think we did it well. Both my brother and I were in the 18th Regiment of the 1st Infantry Division. He was in Company K. I had been moved to Company L shortly before D-Day. My squad was on the headquarters boat. Observing what was going on, we could see firing on the shore. We were waiting to land in the second wave when an officer announced that more men were needed on shore at once and ordered us over the side. The assault boats had pulled up to the transport and we were ready to load. My squad climbed down the rope ladder, boarded the LCVP, and we headed for the beach at about eight o'clock. As we approached the shoreline, I saw that shells were really coming in. Obstacles were everywhere with guys hanging off them and wrecked vehicles. Bodies floated in the water and lay crumpled on the shore. When we got to the beach, there was a beach master and I asked him which way to go. He pointed and said, just follow one of those paths this way or that and watch out for mines. We followed one, moving uphill, and came to a row of wire. There were two Bangalore torpedo men who said they had been pinned down by enemy fire. So we said we'd fire into the trenches to allow them to get into position to blow the wire. One of the men was killed, but the other succeeded, and that let us get off the beach through the breach in the wire. Then my squad and I moved to the trenches. None of my squad had any combat experience. Because I was the only one who had, I knew I really needed to lead them. I got my whole squad across the beach without a casualty. I call my wave the intermittent wave 
because the first wave had landed and they were pinned down on the beach. My guys had wanted to stay there too and burrow in the sand, but I wouldn't let them. I led them off the beach. We were in the hedgerows when the second wave arrived. The first wave had 50% casualties and the second 30%. I was lucky. I call myself a survivor by faith. I had a lot of faith. I was never worried about dying. I had my job to do and I did my job. Walter Ehler's brother, Roland, was killed on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Walter would later receive the Medal of Honor for his service three days after D-Day near Gauville, France. Like A and B companies before us, D Company of the 116th Infantry Regiment came ashore on one of the LCAs launched by HMS Empire Javelin. The enemy artillery found us when we were about 300 yards from shore. To our left, the machine guns that were decimating A Company beat a steady tattoo when we could hear the rounds hitting the LCA next to ours. No one had thought the Germans would give us this kind of opposition at the water's edge. In fact, we had expected A and B companies to have the beach secured by the time we landed but we hit bottom some 200 yards east of our intended position. No one had been where we were going, and that turned boys into men, some of them heroic, some dead, all frightened. As the ramp was lowered and door opened, mortar and artillery shells threw up great sprays of earth and water. My time came to leave the LCA, and I sat on the edge of the bucking ramp so as to time my leap to avoid being squashed under it as it slapped up and down in seven-foot arcs. Someone in front of me had already done it the wrong way and lay dead in the water. Out I went and down, sinking rapidly under water under the weight of more than 60 pounds of gear. As we left the LCA, the water around it filled with dead men and live men acting dead, hoping the tide would carry them to shore. I crouched further and further down as I approached the beach, trying to stay at chin depth, but mortars and small arms fire kept me moving. Pausing briefly behind a giant timber until recognizing the teller mine fastened to the top of it, I took off. Running low and fast, I began to stumble on a tidal pool and nearly blew my foot off in the process of somehow staying upright. That was the last time my weapon would fire until I could clean it because it was packed with sand by the time I reached the seawall. Hunkering down, I hurriedly pulled off my assault jacket, spread my raincoat, and started cleaning my rifle. Both garments, I noticed, had several bullet holes in them. Miraculously, I had none in me, but the discovery made my knees go weak for a minute. A moment later, after getting organized as best we could, we took off toward the base of a hill, out of range of the small arms, Later that afternoon, we still hadn't gotten further than the top of that hill. As stragglers from different units and in varying states of readiness and repair joined our number, I began to sense the extent of the hammering we had taken. We set up a perimeter defense as night finally overtook us. That made it about 11 p.m. Digging shallow foxholes in the shale as we listened to the German unit settling in nearby and rattling cooking utensils, we drew the curtain on the longest day. At the time, I failed to grasp its significance, but I did understand, only too well, the horrific price in blood we had paid for the breach we had made in Hitler's Fortress Europe. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her, and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam god bless america my home sweet home from the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home.
By late 1939, there was little doubt in the mind of anyone in France that the Nazis were headed in our direction. They arrived in my village of avir sur mer on the 19th of June, 1940. Alarmed by rumors that the Nazis would show no mercy to children, we had fled south. We remained in a village near a river bridge for a week. Convinced that the rumors were false, we returned to Normandy. After returning to breville sur mer life almost seemed normal. School started a few weeks later. On the surface, I still had a home and a life, but I also knew the Nazis had taken my country. In fall of 1942, I left my home again, this time to go to Caen, where for the next two years I continued to attend school. The other members of my immediate family remained in breville sur mer At Caen, I lived with my childless aunt and uncle. On the 6th of June, 1944, a friend of my uncle's who had a garage in the suburbs of Caen took us in. We fled on foot, and for the next six weeks, we lived in a pit beneath the repair rack in a garage. As the Allies pressed the attack and the Germans gave ground, we suddenly found ourselves in no man's land. There, we took regular bombardments from the German, Canadian, and British gunners. When it became too dangerous to stay in the pit, my uncle's friend loaded a dozen of us in a wagon and towed it toward the Allies. That no one shot at us amazes me still. Everywhere I looked along the road were the destroyed tanks and cannons of the Germans, Canadians, and British. Once behind Allied lines, it was possible to travel toward Beville Samir. There I found out that my house had been burned on the 7th of June. It was a bittersweet homecoming. I can remember standing at Point du Hoc, looking out at the sea. As far as they could see, there were ships. The amount of material moving across the beach was incredible. In my amazement at what I was seeing, I also felt the sting of losing my home, the relief of discovering my family was alive, and the joy of having my country back. The veterans of that landing and the days that followed it gave me the gift of Normandy. My mother kept a journal of the first few days of the landing. When it started and the bombs began to fall, she asked the German officer, what am I to do? Where am I to go? Go to your shelter outside the house, he said. And then he said, tonight, I shall sleep comfortably in my bed. This invasion will fail. The invasion of Normandy did not fail. By the end of June 6th, Allied forces were assured to stay, and Hitler's Atlantic Wall defenses had been breached on all five beaches. But this victory came at tremendous cost to the Allies. Here on the necrology wall of the National D-Day Memorial, we preserve the names of each Allied soldier, sailor, airman, and Coast Guardsman known to have died on D-Day. 4,415 names are preserved here. 2,502 of those names are American heroes. 1,913 came from seven other Allied nations. The loss was staggering, but their sacrifice made victory possible. Thousands more would die in the weeks and months following the invasion. It would take most of another year before Nazi Germany would finally be vanquished. 75 years ago last month, the Allies celebrated victory in Europe at last. The price was high, the cost unthinkably great. But liberty is also a precious gift, a priceless heritage. And it was their sacrifice which secured that gift for us. Homage. It means to pay heartfelt tribute to someone. Homage requires submission to another's need, a larger purpose, or a duty owed. It is an act of great valor, profound fidelity, and enormous sacrifice. Homage is a fitting title to this evocative piece, 
the last one principal sculptor Jim Brothers created for the National D-Day Memorial before his death in 2013. For the men of D-Day, homage meant a journey across thousands of miles of ocean to a stretch of sand on a foreign shore. It meant bracing up and bearing on into a nightmare of fire and fury. Homage meant pushing oneself forward, even while pulling friends to their feet. For so many, too many, it meant a silent reflection at a makeshift grave, bareheaded and humble. This sculpture features a World War II soldier himself, paying homage to a fallen comrade. When a man was killed in action during World War II, he was often buried by his buddies in a shallow grave, a place of reverence marked by the man's rifle, bayonet affixed and stuck in the ground with his helmet and dog tags to identify the fallen hero. This solitary figure pays homage to his brother in arms, and we pay homage to them and to all those who fell on D-Day. It is at this spot every year that we have an important ceremony take place. Normandy veteran, Ash Rothline of North Carolina, so moved by the sacrifice of Bedford on D-Day, petitioned the nation of France to award the Legion of Honor Medal to the 20 men from this small community who died on Omaha Beach. Ash was soon informed that the Legion of Honor was a decoration given to living veterans of the fight for France in deep appreciation for their role in liberating the nation. But he learned it could not be granted posthumously. Ash understood, but his desire to honor the fallen from Bedford was not abated. He began a tradition that has continued since 2014. Ash brings his own Legion of Honor medal, awarded him by the Republic of France, and hangs it on homage every year on June 6, 1944. He then leads the assembled crowd in a chant, boldly proclaiming, we will never forget. It's Ash's way of paying homage to the fallen heroes of his generation. This year with the national crisis of COVID-19 restricting travel, Ash could not be with us except in spirit. He, like all of our Normandy veterans, are always with us. And though he is not here physically, we are honored to continue his tradition. And we humbly hang his medal on our sculpture homage, reminding ourselves and all who see it that freedom is not free. It is costly and precious and will only endure as we strive to live up to the legacy of those who gave their all in Normandy 76 years ago. This medal is for all those young men who never returned home. If Ash were here, he would want you to repeat this phrase with him as he does every year. And I ask that wherever you are right now, please repeat it with me. We will never forget. We will never forget. We will never forget. To Ash and all of our World War II heroes, thank you. We owe to you our freedom and we will treasure it always. Let us pray. Father, we humbly commend to you all those who, in answer in our nation's call to arms, have paid the price for our freedoms with their lives. Grant them rest eternal. Inspire us as beneficiaries of their dutiful service, ever to be worthy stewards of a legacy bought with their blood. Guide us in our remembrance of those who stormed the beaches of Normandy by land, sea, and air so that we can preserve their legacy for generations to come. Let us never forget. Instill in us the moral courage to honor the valor, fidelity, and sacrifice of our nation's military through a vigilant pursuit of peace, and grant us grace to do so with justice and mercy. We offer our thanks for the gifts of liberty, gifts secured in part by the sacrifices of those who defeated tyranny in World War II. We ask you to bless this memorial that it can be used to educate and inspire future generations. Amen.
My name is Matt Turner, I'm Northern English and I'm sitting in the Dog Green sector on Omaha Beach. I'd like to thank all the veterans at the National D-Day Memorial for your hero heroism during World War II. Thank you. Hi everyone over there at the National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia. Hi, my name is John Fletcher. I'm a young tour guide here in Normandy. I'm originally English, but I've lived in Normandy now most of my life, last 20 years or so. So I'm a tour guide and I'm able to keep your stories alive. But at the same time, I'd like to thank you over there for everything you've done for my freedom and freedom of others especially. Hello, I'm Margot from Normandy. Um, thank you for all what you did in 1944. Thank you for my freedom and we love you veterans. Hello, I am Catherine. I, I live at St. Mary Lise. Thank you very veterans for my liberty. Hello, my name is Philippe from Normandy. A great thank you to all veterans for what they did for us in 1944. Thank you. I would like to say many thanks to the veterans uh, at the National D-Day Memorial, especially those who came liberated in my country, those who fought in, in 1944 and thanks for freedom.